Okay, so it is Wednesday, May 6th, A&P 1. Um, we'll open it up for questions related to lab, maybe, first, before we do lecture. Any questions on lab? I did post some things in Blackboard after Monday's class, as I told you I would, um, related to uh, blood pressure, ECG. Um, I forget the exercises, but we did talk about that the other day. So uh, make sure you check those postings out in Blackboard. I saw you sent an email uh, with the, um, you said we could see our quizzes from last lab. Um, right. I seem to find where you see the results. Because I see it's graded, but I can't see what I did. Well, you should be able to go into the grade center and find your quiz and click on it and it should open it up. Are you uh, trying to use your phone to do it? No, I'm using my laptop. You have to click on the grade that you got. Like when you click on the quiz, it'll pop up saying like lab quiz eight, grade, whatever you got. You click on that grade and then it pops it up. If you want, Joe, hang around after class today and then we'll go in and, and I'll show you. Okay. Um, so let's see, was that Stephanie that was just talking? Yes. Okay, so you have gone in and, and, and looked at it already. Wait a yes. second, I, fo I found it. Okay, because I, I freed it up right after you guys took it. So, you know, you had from uh, noon to six, and I, and I freed up the answer key at 6.01. So, okay, so if you, did you get into it, Joe, or, or not? Uh, yeah, I found it, thanks. Okay. Okay, any questions on the quiz stuff? Don't forget the practical is Tuesday the 12th from two to six. I'll remind you of that on Monday, our last class on the 11th, but uh, that's coming up. So what will the practical be on? Is it 19, 20, 21, 22, 23? Or was that on the last one? Yeah, yeah, 19 through okay. 23. 37 through 41, 45, 46. Okay. Again, you can reference the updated syllabus and it lists all of the different exercises, but basically the exercises that we have done since the second lab practical. Yeah. Okay. So let's turn our attention if there are no questions on the lab stuff, to chapter 16, which we got into on Monday. And I'm gonna pull up the PowerPoint here. And um, see if you guys have any questions on that. Um, let's see, this is a PDF, I don't want that. Um, I got a quick question about the chapter 14. Okay. Um, so we're saying that lymph is the extracellular fluid that the lymph system is taking away from the cells. So where does the extracellular fluid come from? Is that something that the cells create? No, actually, a, a lot of it comes from the uh, blood. It, there, there's water and other materials that actually come out of the blood capillaries. Mm -hmm. So that's the main source of, of extracellular fluid. Okay. And that's described a little bit if you go back into the blood chapter 
they talk a little bit about that. We didn't talk much about um, that process, but it, it is talked about there on 582, 583. Um, but, but basically that's, that's the answer. Okay. All right, let me get into where I want to go here. All right, so do you see in front of you now the PowerPoint? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, any questions on stuff we talked about Monday? Because this slide picks up kind of where we left off. Um, but I can, I can pull up the first half of the PowerPoint if you'd like to look at any of those slides or if you have questions on things we talked about on Monday. Um, I have a question from the last video. I went back over it. And I know it was mentioned that you can't take blood pressure from like the arm if they had a mastectomy. What if they had a double mastectomy? Where do they? That's a good question. What do they do then? I do not know. Okay. That's a great question. Um, it's, it's not that, that they couldn't take the blood pressure, but it does increase the risk of problems. Mm -hmm. So it's not like they couldn't do it. And I think if somebody were in that situation and they had to, mo to monitor and take the blood pressure, they probably would still do that. That's my sense. Um, but I don't know if there's another way of taking blood pressure other than with the arm. There may very well be. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. Does anybody here know, Sarah? I think you were familiar with that a little bit the other day. I didn't hear the whole question. What was it? If a double mastectomy individual, how do they get their blood pressure taken? Um, if we can't take the blood pressure on the arms, we usually take it on the thigh. Okay. Using a bigger cuff of some sort, a, a different setup probably. Yeah, if we had one. Um, and then if we couldn't just take it on the thigh, we would have to take it like on the calf. Which is super reliable, but. <laughs> okay. Uh huh. Thank you. Great. You're welcome. That helps to answer that. Good question, Michaela. Uh huh. Other questions? What was the three? Um, I don't even know what it was related to. The three functions that we talked about last, the last class. I know the first one had to do with like fluid balance. The second was lipid absorption. I didn't. I just didn't get them all written down. This is um, early in the in the PowerPoint. The third was defense, which we're going to be talking about today a lot in Monday. Okay. Yeah. Go back, access the PowerPoint in Blackboard, and it's there. Okay, so we talked about um, lymph nodes at the end of class Monday, and we said that there were lymphocytes housed within those lymph nodes, right, both in the medulla, the center of the lymph node, as well as around the cortex in those nodule regions. And we said that those lymph nodes were monitoring the lymph for potential pathogens. Pathogens would be something that would cause disease or infection. And that's kind of what those T cells and B cells and macrophages are doing. They're monitoring the lymph because there's lymph flowing through those nodes, right? As we go from the lymph capillaries eventually to the two collecting ducts and then that lymph becomes part of what? I'm part of the blood. Right, the blood plasma. Okay, 
In addition to the lymph nodes, we have other lymphatic organs, including this guy. Actually, two, showing both the thymus and the spleen. So here you see the position of the thymus relative to the right and left lungs. Of course, the heart, you see here, the diaphragm, you recognize some of these structures, I would hope. And so located just superior to the heart, sort of posterior to the aortic arch, which is kind of hidden here, is this organ called the thymus. We'll talk about the spleen a little bit later, but you might remember seeing this when we did the rat dissection, like the second or third lab this semester, if you remember. Located uh, sort of lateral to the stomach, inferior to the diaphragm, right? Remember that spleen? Okay, so more on the spleen a little bit later. Back to the thymus. What's quite interesting is that the thymus reaches its largest size proportionally when you are a young person, a kid. So here's the heart, lungs, thymus in a youngster. And here it is in an adult. And what we see here is how much smaller it is proportionally to what it was as you were growing up. Just sort of interesting. And the thymus is a really, really important organ lymphoid organ, because within it are these little compartments. This is a histologic section through the thymus, and you can see it's been stained, of course, to bring out particular features, uh, not the least of which are these things called lobules, those little compartments. And it's inside these lobules of the thymus where T lymphocytes, which were formed back in the bone marrow, this is where they kind of grow up and become adult T cells. So whenever you hear T cell, think thymus derived, because that's where the T comes from. So the, the T cells produced in the red bone marrow travel via the circulatory system to the thymus glands where they will mature. And then from there, they can go out to say the lymph node or other parts of the body and do their surveillance function, okay? And so this box simply indicates that part of that maturation process of the T cells within the thymus occurs under the effect, if you will, of these hormones called thymosins. And so the prefix kind of leads you to the thymus, I hope, thymosin. So these are hormones produced by this gland that help in the stimulation, if you will, of those T cells to become mature T lymphocytes. Our spleen, as we said a moment ago, located inferior to the diaphragm and sort of lateral to the stomach, is our biggest lymphatic organ. And what's kind of interesting about the spleen is it's not filtering lymph like lymph nodes do, it's filtering your blood. What is it filtering blood of? Well, it's filtering the blood of pathogens, just like the lymph nodes have those T cells and B cells there, the macrophages, who are there to keep an eye open for potential bacteria or viruses or whatever might be causing you potential infection or disease. These pathogens can be found in your bloodstream as well. And so it's here that we also have T cells and B cells and macrophages monitoring the blood of pathogens. And so here, of course, is a little chunk we take out of the spleen. This is an artist's sketch. Here's an actual histologic section that's been stained. And it brings out two important structures. They have sort of a funny names. So they're called white pulp and red pulp. The red pulp is around the edges here, if you will, of these little kind of circular structures. And the white pulp is found in the very center. So if you just kind of remember lighter colored, lighter stained, that's the white. And then around it, the darker red color, red stain is the red pulp. And as I said, it's here in the red and white pulp that we have 
lymphocytes and macrophages. And of course, red infers the presence of red blood cells as well. So that might help you remember the difference between red and white. The white pulp doesn't have any red cells in it. It's primarily lymphocytes that have left the bloodstream and gone to this region of the spleen. While the red pulp is actually, you know, connected to the to the blood supply, which you can see here in red. There's our splenic artery leading into the spleen. Here's our splenic vein leading away. And as we trace that red um, colored splenic artery, you can see how it eventually branches into arterioles and eventually then into capillary beds. And um, again, around the very edge is where we would find the blood cells in the capillaries. And then in the very core is this white pulp that has the, uh, the lymphocytes solely in the white pulp. In the red, you have both red and white cells. In the white, just lymphocytes. So they're monitoring the blood. So we used the term um, pathogen, I think, earlier. This is again what the, the T's and the B cells and the macrophages are looking for, whether it's in the lymph or in the blood. So when you think of pathogen, what comes to mind? Anything? The word pathogen. What do you think of when you hear that word? Virus. Okay, yeah, virus maybe. Bacteria. Bacteria, yeah. Pollution. Pollution. Um, well, pollution isn't alive. This is a living entity. Well, I got to be careful how I say that because viruses aren't technically alive. Um, a pathogen would be a, a typically a cell, but it, it could be a virus, which isn't a cell, something that's going to cause a disease or an, or an infection. And you've listed a couple of those, right, including viruses. We are in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic, obviously, a virus. You all know, you've heard of it for the last eight weeks. Six months ago, you had no idea what COVID-19 was. Nobody hardly did. Now it's, you can't escape it. It's everywhere, in the news, in the paper, on, you know, <laughs> in our communities, some might argue. Hopefully not. Um, so viruses um, are a category of pathogen, but you notice that I put the word acellular here in brackets next to the, to the word. This is not a cell. A means without. So when we hear about treatments for COVID-19, you've, you've heard this on the news, you know, what can we use to help kill the virus? Have you heard that word kill? If you've been listening to the news, you have. And really, it's, it's not an appropriate word to use from a strict microbiological point of view. We use it in our everyday lexicon because people out there in the real world have not studied virology. They haven't studied biology. They don't realize that a virus is not a cellular entity. It is not alive. It doesn't have a nucleus. It's basically a nucleic acid surrounded by a protein. That's in essence what a virus is. So you might think, well, how does a virus cause problems? Well, viruses, in order to complete their life cycle, must get into host cells. Basically, host cells are infected with virus. A classic example I could give you is HIV, the AIDS virus. It targets a particular type of T cell called a T helper cell, which you're going to learn about in chapter 16. So in order to complete their life cycle and to replicate, these viruses must get into host cells. And we see here a listing in this uh, box here of some different types of um, infections, some of which you've heard of before. Flu, right? Some of you, some of you had flu shots this year. You're getting that flu shot to protect you from a flu virus. 
Here's AIDS, HID. Uh, hepatitis, maybe you've heard of that. Chicken pox, you've all heard of chicken pox. Measles. Ebola has been in the news the last 10 years or so. There's many, many others, but those are caused by viruses. These, these acellular entities that have to get into host cells and then basically the host cells are reprogrammed by the virus to make more viral proteins and to make more viral DNA or RNA because there are DNA viruses and RNA viruses. And then eventually those viruses are, are, are packaged together by the host cell and the host cell um, often then dies as the viruses explode out to go on to infect other host cells and it's a vicious cycle. So certainly viruses fall under the category of pathogen. So would bacteria, which you mentioned a moment ago too. We've heard of staph infections. You've probably had strep throat at some point in your life. That's caused by a bacterium. You've heard of Lyme disease. Lyme disease is caused by the bite of a tick. The tick is harboring the bacterium that gives you Lyme disease. Okay, we, we talk about the tick being a vector. It helps to transmit the bacterium into the person by biting the person, right? Um, tuberculosis or TB, pneumonia. You've all heard of these things, I'm sure. Uh, salmonella gets in the news once in a while. Salmonella outbreaks where they have to recall spinach or um, what else? Oh, you, you, every couple of months you hear about a salmonella outbreak in, in vegetables or it could even be in, in meat too. Fungi or fungi. Um, we don't often think of fungi as being pathogenic. Um, when we think of fungi, I think of what's growing out on that dead tree in the, in the woods, right? or the mushroom growing in my backyard in the wet spring or, or fall time of the year. But there are certain types of pathogenic fungi that cause issues. If you're a female, you've certainly heard of yeast infections, right? That's a fungus. Um, this term here is really a misnomer, ringworm. This implies worm, which is not a fungus, it's, a, it's an animal, uh, but we still call it ringworm, it's, it's due to a fungal infection. Um, protozoa, these are single celled organisms that live in water or a watery environment. Um, malaria, you've heard of that before. What do you associate malaria with? It's the first thing that pops into your mind when you see that word. Mosquitoes. Yeah, me too. Because the mosquito, like I mentioned earlier with regard to Lyme disease, utilizes a vector to transmit the protozoan. So the mosquito would bite you if you lived in a tropical country that typically has to be pretty hot and humid throughout the year before you're gonna to have to deal with malaria problems. Up here in the north, part of North America, malaria, you don't hear much about malaria. It still can be found in the, in the southern states, but you go to Brazil, you go to the Amazon, you go to parts of Africa, you can run into malaria issues. So the mosquito is harboring in it a specific type of protozoan uh, by the name of plasmodium, that's the scientific name. And when the, when the female mosquito bites you to get your blood, because it needs it for its eggs, it introduces the plasmodium into your body and then it can cause lots of problems. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned to you guys or was it the microbiology class, there's a, a student in the nursing program, um, Raquel, anybody know Raquel? You're not in the, in the program quite yet, but um, she's from Venezuela. She's a JCC OLEAN student. I've had her in a &P last year. She's had malaria like three times when she lived in Venezuela. Yeah. Wow. So she could give you a, 
a personal account as to what that was like, and uh, it's not fun. Um, one symptom of malaria is periodic fever. Uh, every 24 to 48 hours, your fever peaks, and then it drops off. And then another day or two, depending upon the species of plasmodium that you've got in you, your fever goes back up again. So you have these periodic terrible fevers. It's just really rough. So there's medication you can take to control that. Uh, and actually for most of these protozoan diseases, uh, you, you know, there's stuff you can take. Giardia um, is, the, is the causative protozoan for this thing called giardiasis. This is you get from drinking water that's contaminated with the protozoan. Uh, we have this around here. Um, if you go out, say, walking uh, in Allegheny National Forest, or you could be out in Colorado in the high country backpacking, and it's a hot July day, and you're running low on water, and there's this nice spring coming out of the hillside. The water's really, really, really clear and really, really cold. And it's like, oh, I gotta have a drink. And, and, I've, and I've done this before. I've taken my chances, and I've just drank the, the high mountain, you know, cold water high, high in mountains, but you run the risk of ingesting this microscopic little protozoan that can give you really bad dysentery. I mean, really, really bad. The only good thing is, if you want to call it good, is that you don't generally get it until about four or five days after you've ingested the Giardia. But it's not fun. So anyway, these could potentially be pathogens that our immune system could recognize and react to. And then we have like bigger parasites, like tapeworms and roundworms. Um, these you typically would get if you ate pork or beef or meat that was undercooked. You could potentially get a tapeworm or a roundworm. And there are people walking around um, with those in their digestive system. It's pretty gross, but it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. And some of these can kill you. They can burrow up into your brain and uh, all sorts of really interesting life cycles of these, uh, these roundworms and tapeworms. We won't spend any time talking about that, but there's some interesting stuff there. And then there is this sort of sixth category of infectious Proteins. What the heck is that, you think? A protein, a molecule, an organic molecule, that can hurt me? Yes, that could kill you. They're referred to as prions. Has anybody ever heard of prions? No? Prions. Let's talk about prions a little bit. They're very interesting. These are infectious proteins. Now remember, what are proteins made of? Basically, what are the building blocks of proteins? Anybody know? The building blocks of proteins. Uh, was it uh, chromatin? No, that's DNA. You're close. Amino acids. Amino acids? Yes, amino acids, exactly. Yeah, the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. And then when we link those uh, together, in a process called translation, which we talked about back in chapter three, I think it was, or four, um, our cells generate proteins. And most of the time, those proteins have a particular shape that dictates their function, right? Yeah. Well, these particular prion proteins are misshapen proteins, and they don't work to your benefit. Let's just say that. They can cause problems. So we're going to talk about a couple different diseases caused by prions. Maybe you've heard of these, maybe one of them or two of them. The first one that we'll mention there is called scrapie disease. I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment. It's more common in sheep and goats. Scrapie disease. Maybe you've heard of the second one, mad cow disease. Has anybody ever heard of mad cow? Julianne is shaking her head. Yeah. 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 Mad cow disease. And then this third one called Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. This J sounds like a Y. Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease or CJD. Here's an animal 
that is suffering from scrapey disease. This is obviously a sheep. And you can see how the fleece is falling off the sheep. And the reason for that is because one symptom of prion disease in sheep and goats is it kind of drives them crazy and they're always rubbing themselves against a fence post or a tree or whatever they can find. And eventually they rub so much that they're literally tearing their old fleece off themselves. It's really kind of sad to see. All of these prion diseases eventually affect the brain of the animal. They're neurological, uh, ultimately. Mad cow disease gets its name from the behavior of the animal because it, it acts kind of crazy, kind of weird, very abnormal. This is also referred to in the clinical uh, sense. Uh, it's called bovine spongiform encephalopathy. That's a mouthful. Bovine cow spongiform kind of talks about the, the spaces that begin to form in the brain tissue of the animal. Encephalopathy refers to, again, uh, a brain issue. And um, this was first um, confirmed about 20 years ago in the US. Um, and a few years after that, there was a really bad infection of prion disease in Great Britain where almost 200 people died from eating contaminated beef. So the beef had the prion in it and the individuals unfortunately ingested the, the prion and then it, it killed them. Um, and when you think about that, how did the cow get the prion? Well, it's interesting. One way that these cows, both in the US and in Britain or wherever you're raising cattle, one way they got it was from eating other cows. <laughs> That's usually the reaction I get when I say that. Juliana's like, what? Cows don't eat cows. Cows eat grass out in the field where the butterflies are, you know, th this tranquil, ephemeral, beautiful vision we have of cows. That's not usually how most cows live. Most cows are raised in big feedlots. You've been hearing about this issue in the news lately, right? Beef, chicken, pork, slaughterhouses are having big COVID breakouts because of how close people are working together, right? Yeah. So we have, we have come to perfect the raising of cows and pigs and sheep and goats and chickens very, very effectively and efficiently, and usually on large commercial scales. So if you're a beef farmer in Colorado or Texas, and you've got a thousand head of feed of, of, of uh, cows, um, you don't have enough space for let, to let them go out and just graze whenever they want to graze. They, they get fed at certain times of the day in big troughs. The, the truck or the tractor pulls up and out spills the feed into the trough and the cows come. You, you've seen this, right? You know what I'm talking about. So what are they eating? Well, they're eating grain that's been mixed with silage, other plant materials, you know, as well. But there's also filler material in there too. And the filler material came from yesterday's butchering operation. Okay, now this is gonna be news to some of you. So when, when a cow gets taken to the slaughterhouse, yes, it gets cut up into sirloin steak, round steak, hamburger, blah, 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 blah. Well, whatever happens to the brain and spinal cord and the bones and the connective tissues. I don't know. <laughs> well, I never thought about that. Well, a lot of that stuff gets put into a machine that grinds all that up. And that gets added to the silage and the corn and the grains that gets fed back to the cows. 
And remember, this is a neurological disease. So what actually kills the cow or kills the animal is its nervous system completely crashes. And so one symptom of somebody, a cow with mad cow disease, if you've ever seen this is on the you know, news, is they're able, unable to stand. They're, they're just exhibiting really weird behaviors. Their brain is basically being affected. And eventually the cow goes into like a coma and just dies. So when they were butchering these animals in England back in 2009, they were, they were selling ground beef that had, had filler in it, okay? Um, or I should say, when they, they, they got it from the cow that had eaten the filler, and the cow was eating the brain and spinal cord of, of his cousins, <laughs> and that's how it gets in the cow. And then when you butcher the cow, it gets into the meat. And when you eat the meat, you get the prion. So it's a it's a really nasty kind of weird, uh, you know, life cycle, if you will, of of this sort of disease. Well, anyway, look at the difference between these two brains. Uh, you can see one here. Of course, the control group is the one that's not impacted by the prion. Here's the prion diseased brain. I think this is actually of. I'm not sure if this is a cow or a human. This might be human. What do you notice? It's, it's a lot smaller, right? And these two structures here in the middle, these are called the brain ventricles. You'll learn about those next semester when you take ENT2. The ventricles are larger also in the prion disease uh, brain. And there's more spaces here than you have gaps in the control brain. They're just, they're just bigger gaps. So this is telling us that the brain tissue is being impacted. And when you look at it histologically, you see these larger gaps. Now this is magnified probably, you know, three, 400 times, but these white gaps shouldn't be there. Kind of like Swiss cheese has holes in it kind of thing. So you have these holes in the brain tissue as a result of the prion. The prion actually causes this to happen. And it interferes with nerve impulse conduction within the brain, within the spinal cord. So I'm gonna show you a little video here. This is about a three minute video of, um, story of a couple, uh, the wife ended up getting kreutzfeldt jakob disease. This is a book all of the scrapbook and pen came. Love dragonflies, read the dragonfly. For Ken Lavin, the warm memories of his 17 years with wife Michelle well up just as quickly as the tears of loss. You know, I always smile to laugh, to laugh to begin. Okay. In March of 2011, 42-year-old Michelle experienced a sudden onset of stroke-like symptoms, difficulty speaking, confusion, and odd movements. All tests came back negative, and she was sent home. But Michelle was still struggling. You know, everything was not working. She put her shirts on backwards. Within a few days, Michelle was back in the hospital to stay. Stroke and meningitis were ruled out. Kip says primary care doctors and specialists were stopped. And then, without the chance to ever say goodbye, his wife was gone. 40 days, I think, from the beginning to the end, it was done. The diagnosis, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, CJD. There is no treatment, and it is always fatal. We call rapid use of That's uh, something that affects cognitive skills, memory, thinking, behavior, um, and it comes on rapidly. Mayo Clinic neurologist Dr. Alan Axenet says an abnormal infectious protein called a prion is believed to be the cause of CJD, actually creating holes in and around neurons in the brain. It co-ops the normal protein and then it becomes a self-replicating or self-amplifying process, which essentially kills neurons and, and gets transmitted to other neurons in the vicinity. Dr. Axenet says 90% of cases are sporadic, striking spontaneously without a known cause. The other 10% are familial, which was Michelle's case. Kip says that means their sons, Cody and Devin, have a 50-50 chance of developing CJD, a possibility he finds very hard to bear. The normal person, if you knew you had it, you couldn't get married, you couldn't have kids, you know. Since CJD affects just one in a million people, research is slow to progress, yet that is Kip's only hope of erasing the long shadow cast by a dreaded disease. For Mayo Clinic News Network, I'm Dennis Dota. So, Again, she inherited a mutation 
which is uh, a, a different cause of the disease than having uh, acquired it via, you know, meat that's been kept contaminated with the prion. But uh, think about that. That's that's pretty sad if you consider that your kids have a flip of the coin chance of dying from this, you know, in a very short period of time. It really happens fast. I'm almost positive that a girl that I went to high school with, like last spring or something, lost her mom to this. Oh, wow. Interesting. Is it just a matter of cooking your meat better? Um, n not necessarily. Uh, unlike a tapeworm, tapeworm or a roundworm, if you if you cook the meat sufficiently, you'll kill the parasite. These prions, these infectious proteins, can withstand temperatures well above what it would be if you baked it or cooked it in the in the on the stove. So there's no guarantee you can. De they're hard to denature. These proteins are really really hard to denature. So no, there's not much you can do. I mean, when when this happens. The federal government will will just try to you know trace it back to the herd of cattle and and probably euthanize them all. Don't let them get sent to market. But in in some instances, the dye is cast and the meat's already out there. So they they're trying to monitor this all the time. And it's not super common, but it it has occurred. So we want to talk now about you know, the way in which your body protects itself against infectious agents, be they bacteria or viruses, for example, or other pathogens we talked a little bit about. And we're going to think about these defense mechanisms as being both innate um, Is somebody chatting here? I just had something pop up on my screen here. No. Okay, Janelle has to go to work. Okay. Um, innate or nonspecific and adaptive or specific defenses. That's what we're going to spend our, our remaining time today and on Monday talking about. So What's the major difference between the two? Well, when we talk about innate, and we're going to focus on that today, we're talking about defenses that we have at our disposal to protect us against all types of pathogens, no matter how many times we may have been infected by them. These defense systems are always there all the time to protect us against any and all possible foreign invaders that could cause disease for infection. Okay. And we're gonna go through a table that talks about different types of innate specific, non-specific defense protocols that we have, that you have right now. One of which is the fact that our own unique species, Homo sapiens is our scientific name, right? You've all heard of that. By virtue of the fact that we have our own built-in innate system protects us from potential pathogens that might cause illness in other species. So for example, something that might cause your cat or dog to get sick, a particular pathogen, let's say. Some of those we don't have to worry about because we have this built-in species-specific defense. In the same way that one thing that might make us sick might not, in, not impact our horse or our cow or our sheep because they have their own species resistance. So this is an evolutionary thing that, and again, I, it's complicated. We don't have time to go into it, you know, exactly how this develops, but it's an evolutionary protection basically. But notice what I've added to the last part of this line. But some pathogens, quote, make the leap. Do you know what that means? mutate to become a virus or pathogen that 
can affect the opposite whatever species. The Ida bat in Wuhan. Right. If we if we listen to one per, one hypothesis as to where this COVID nineteen came from, one hypothesis has been that if you go back to Wuhan in one of those markets where they're selling bush meat, <clears throat> which is basically wild, an wild animals that are brought in, butchered and sold as food, that once in a while, some of these pathogens, while they might be restricted, let's say, to a given species, like let's say bats, because that's one theory that COVID came from. But when we are in intimately working with these animals, i.e., you know, raising them or butchering them, sometimes these pathogens can jump from the bat species to the human species and now we could potentially suffer the ill effects of that and that happens quite often in fact many of the flu viruses that we face each fall originate in asia often in pigs or or chickens mostly pigs and they make this leap from they pigs to humans birds. it's very interesting do they come from birds too? There, there can be some, yep, like bird bird flu. Um, that was in the paper in the news not too many years ago. Well, I watched um, the documentary on Netflix that was like how to prevent a pandemic, and the birds, they like they tag the birds and they come back every year and they test them to see if they brought back something new. Oh, interesting. Uh huh. Yeah. Birds are, are, of course, able to migrate and, and, and they move throughout the world, can't they? Yeah. So that's one way that viruses and other pathogens can, can, can travel, you know, distances geographically, just if you think about, you know, for example, a bird that's migrating. Yeah. So our own species resistance provides us with some innate protection. We also have mechanical barriers at our disposal, not the least of which is skin, right? We talked about this back in the integumentary system. We said one of the major functions of skin was in protection. And certainly it is. Even though our epidermis is exceedingly thin, it nonetheless is a very important barrier. Because remember we talked about burn victims? What are the two major things that burn victims have to be concerned about? Dehydration and what? Infection. Infection, right. You lose that skin, you are at the mercy of all these potential pathogens that are in the air, in our environment, yeah. And all it takes is a little cut, right? To introduce bacteria into our skin and cause a little infection. We've all suffered from that. But luckily our immune system can take over and kind of protect us. Um, we also talked about the uh, pseudostratified ciliated columnar that line our trachea and our nasal cavity. And we talked about how the mucus was there to trap the particulates, right? And the cilia were there to move that mucus upward away from the lungs. And we either, you know, spit it out or more than likely swallow it, put it into the stomach, right? And that pH 2 is going to knock off those pathogens that were present. Um, so we have these mechanical barriers there to protect us, no matter whether it's a virus or a, a prion or a, a bacterium, these mechanical barriers are there to provide protection. It's sort of like if you think of a, of a castle, um, the, the uh, typical view that people think of when they think of a castle is this big stone building and what's around the periphery of the castle? Moat. A moat. And what's in the moat? What's always in the moat? Alligators. <laughs> Alligators. Now if you live in Northern Ireland where there's lots of castles, guess what? There's Alligators cattle. can't live in cold places, but Walt Disney and other cartoons, of course, always picture the alligator. And that's, that's a defense for that imaginary castle, okay? So this is, this is sort of like the same thing. This is our first initial moat, if you will, our skin, protected, physical protection. Can things get by the moat, through the moat, over the moat? Yes. Yeah. And then what does the castle have? 
Well, it's going to have a secondary layer of protection, right? Maybe it's the big three foot thick stone. Okay, use your imagination. And so we have a secondary line of defense too. If the, bath, if the pathogen potentially gets into our bloodstream through the skin, through a cut, we have other systems in place. We talked about the pH of the stomach, right? Two, pH two, that's extremely acidic. Did you know that your tear ducts or your, 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 uh, your tear glands produce a, a liquid, we call it tear, tears. The tears themselves, that fluid has an antimicrobial uh, property to it, chemistry to it. Now, you know, what do they always tell you with respect to how you can avoid getting the flu? What's the best thing you can do? Wash your hands. Right, you wash, your hands. wash your hands, right? Absolutely true, Amanda, good. And what else should you not do? Touch your face. Right. Your eyes, mm -hmm. your nose, your mouth. Exactly, because if we touch our eyes, which you know they say like the average person touches their face like, I don't know, God, it's like 10 times a minute or something, it's just weird. But I'm not gonna argue with statistics, but we're always touching ourselves. And when we touch our near our eyes, this is a potential portal of entry into our body. We don't think about this much. But if you have bacteria on your skin, your fingers, and you go to rub an itch above your eye, eyelid, you're depositing bacteria there. And that could potentially get into the body via the eyes. Well, we have this built-in lysozyme, it's called, it's an enzyme in the tear fluid that will kill a lot of those potential pathogens. That's interesting. When you get uh, hot and you're perspiring, you're secreting lots of sweat, right? And your sweat is very salty, right? Did you ever think about any antimicrobial property of sweat? That it's like salty. Yeah, what does the salt do? You're right. Um, is it like, I just heard something on the news about the beaches like why they're closed. Some people were arguing that because of the salt water and the uh, sea that it was like a natural disinfectant. Uh huh. Is that where you're going? Well, I, it's kind of peripherally where I'm going with that. Yeah, I'm not talking about beaches, but I mean, like you, you, you know, you know that your sweat is salty, and I'm, I'm telling you that there's some protective function to that salt. I don't know that I buy the salt water in the beach is protecting from COVID. I don't, I don't necessarily buy that argument myself, but I know what you're saying. Let's go back to your sweaty arm that you <laughs> that you have. How is that protecting you? Um, the salt in your sweat breaks down the um, molecular compound of the virus or whatever is trying to get in. I think you're getting warm. I don't think I'd buy the breakdown thing. Think more about this. We talked about this back in lab about two months ago. The effect of salt on cell membranes. We subjected blood to different salt solutions. Do you remember this? Oh, it, it perforates. What does it do to cells? Sucks out the water. Right. It causes them to shrink, to crenate. They lose water. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's a good example of how when you create a hypertonic solution, and that's what you're doing, the increased salts concentration on the skin, if any bacteria fall on that, they lose water. Water moves from a high to low concentration toward a higher solute and the cells die. That's kind of interesting. Here's another chemical that we have in our bodies that we produce when we have a viral infection. Um, it can also actually help us to fight off cancer cells as well. It's a chemical called interferon. And there's different kinds of interferons. We won't get into the different kinds, but there's at least six or eight different kinds of interferons. And they have a, they have a whole bunch of different roles to play. You see them listed here. They say induce production of other proteins that block reproduction of viruses. Now remember I said earlier, in order for a virus to complete its life cycle, what does it have to do? It 
has to get into a host cell. That's the only way viruses cause problems. It's like get into host cells. Maybe they're your cells. But if we can somehow prevent that replication of the virus in the host cell, then the viruses aren't going to cause problems. And we'll, we'll see how, how interferon helps to do that in just a moment. Here it says also interferons help to stimulate phagocytosis. What does that mean? Stimulate phagocytosis. The eating of the eating of the cell or the bacteria. Yeah, if the bacterium is the is the uh, the pathogen, which it could very well be, then sometimes what our body will do um, is produce this interferon. Although this is often in connection with with viruses, although it, it could be bacteria, I guess, too. But most of the time, I think of, of uh, viruses. But maybe it's a virus that got into a host cell. Um, but nonetheless, phagocytosis is the, the process, as Amanda said, of a white cell coming up and, and engulfing that pathogen and eventually killing it, right? Is that a good thing for you? If it's not attacking the healthy. Yes. Well, if it's, a, if it's a pathogen, by definition, it's causing you harm. So mm -hmm. stimulation of phagocytosis is a good thing for you because yeah. your immune cells are trying to gobble that thing up and kill it. Okay. So let's watch this video that specifically will talk about the role that interferon plays in terms of action against a virus. When a cell is infected by a virus, the virus enters the cell and produces structures that are not found in uninfected cells. The presence of this viral material signals the cell to produce interferon. The interferon moves out of the cell and attaches to receptors on nearby cells of the same type. The cell that produces the interferon is unable to save itself the virus replicates in this cell and then moves out to infect nearby cells. The nearby cell that already has interferon bound to its surface responds in several ways, including production of enzymes that degrade messenger RNA and prevent protein synthesis. Thus, a virus can attach and enter the cell, but completion of the viral replication cycle is prevented. Okay, so let's watch that video one more time. I'll turn off the, uh, the narrative and we'll just talk about it. So here's the virus coming into a host cell. Remember, all viruses, in order to complete their life cycle, must get into a host cell. That's where they're going to cause problems. And the host cell, basically what it does is it gets the instruction booklet via the nucleic acid here of the virus to make more viral protein, which is what this kind of geometric structure is around the nucleic acid. This is called the, the protein capsid. And this uh, pink thing is, is illustrating either DNA or RNA. There's DNA viruses and RNA viruses. So what this host cell does is it, know it's, it knows it's being invaded. It knows that it will be forced to make more viral nucleic acid and more viral protein. In other words, more viruses. But look what else it does in response. It produces this chemical called interferon. That's what this kind of funny looking green thing is. This cell is making this, this chemical and it secretes it. And this interferon will be taken up or, or basically bonded to the cell membrane of another identical type of cell. This is your cells here. So one of your cells got infected. In response to that infection, it produces interferon. Now, this cell that was originally infected, it can't do anything other than secrete interferon. It's going to make more virus particles. It's, it, it just has to do that. It, it's commanded to do that by the instruction booklet that it got from the virus, the DNA or RNA. And so here's our viral particles that are, are basically being ejected from the dying cell. And now these viruses are going to go on, uh, presumably, to infect other cells and keep on replicating and so on and so forth until you get really, really sick. But this cell that's got the interferon from its neighbor, oh, the virus is going to get in, but this cell has a trick up its sleeve. It's going to basically prevent 
the replication and or the transcription of the messenger RNA of the virus. That, that's an important process we talked about back earlier in one of the chapters. Transcription was where messenger RNA is made from DNA. And then in translation, the messenger RNA is used along with the rRNA and transfer RNA to make protein. So this interferon triggers the formation of enzymes in the cell that will destroy the messenger RNA of the virus. And so if you can't make viral proteins, you can't make viruses. So you stop the process of viral replication right in its tracks. That's what interferon does. It's a really effective antiviral uh, secretion that cells make, protects other cells. Okay. You can watch that again sometime if you want. So I have a question. Does it so does it keep going until that process happens and it stops? Like it would keep moving. Like say when you're sick, it's still moving through your body, and then when it meets a cell that's going to stop it, that's when you start to like feel better or no? Well, the the release of interferon by those initially infected cells <clears throat> is going to protect these other cells. That, that get it, that get the interferon. So certainly the symptoms could begin to abate as the virus is unable to replicate itself in your body. And then there's all sorts of other things that are going on here as well. We've, we're just talking about one event. There's other immune responses taking place as well, but this is an important one. The goal is to prevent viral replication because the more virus you have in your body, the more it's, it's replicating and growing, the, the worse it is for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is that how you become um, or develop immunity to viruses? Like, no, this doesn't. This doesn't provide you with that. We'll talk about what provides you with protection coming up. Okay. This is just addressing the immediate concern, and that is let's stop viral replication as much as we can. That's what interferon basically does. Good questions. Another innate nonspecific defense is referred to as the complement system. And I'm running out of time, but I would like you to cut and paste this YouTube video and watch it. It's really, really good. It's really well done. It's about eight minutes long, and it will talk about these plasma proteins that are floating around in our bloodstream and also throughout our entire body that are part of what's called the complement system complement system. Um, I'm going to show you this short little video <clears throat> that will talk a little bit about what some of these complement proteins do. Um, we use the letter C to stand for complement, and then there's different kinds, which are denoted by letters and numbers. So let's just see what some of these complement proteins can help us do in terms of innate defense. Regardless of whether the complement system is activated by the classical, alternative selection pathway, the activated complement proteins are involved in several important processes associated with host defenses, including inflammation, attraction of neutrophils, opsonization, and cell lysis. Complement C3A participates in inflammation by inducing changes that cause the walls of local blood vessels to become more permeable. This facilitates movement of phagocytic cells from the circulation into the tissue. Complement 5A induces a directed hemopathic migration of phagocytes to the site of complement activation. Complement C3B functions as an opsonin. It binds to microbial cells, making them more susceptible to phagocytosis. Complement protein C5B, C6, C7, C8, and C9 react together to form a hole in the cell membrane. When C5 convertase converts C5 into C5A and C5B, the C5B binds to the cell surface and combines with C6. C5B6 binds C7, enabling it to insert into the membrane. Binding of C8 is followed by binding of several C9s. The hole generated by formation of this membrane attack complex causes the cell to lyse. Now this cell that the video talks about, that would be 
that would be like, say, the, the cell membrane maybe of a bacterium or the cell membrane of a protozoan, like say cause malaria. And these letters and numbers, again, each represent specific types of complement proteins. And initially, they're just kind of laying around, uh, floating around in your body. But when you get an infection, let me turn this off. Um, when you get an infection, like here we have a splinter, okay, introduced into the skin, and here's some bacteria that are on the tip of that splinter. We want to be able to try to address that introduction of pathogens. And some of these complements have different ways of doing that, one of which is to promote the inflammatory response. That's what this particular complement, C3A, is called, what it does. Attraction of neutrophils. Neutrophils are what? What are neutrophils? White blood cells. Right, they're a type of white cell. Attraction of neutrophils. Why is that a good thing? Well, if you attract neutrophils to that injury or to that infection site, these things can phagocytize the bacteria. Yeah. Opsonization, we'll talk about that in just a moment. That actually coats the pathogen. It marks it for easier, easier identification by phagocytic cells. And lysis is basically talking about punching holes in the wall of the cell membrane uh, of the pathogen. So here's that C3A complement protein, which it talks about how it associates with the lining of the capillary, which makes it more permeable. So these phagocytic cells like macrophages and neutrophils, they can leave the bloodstream and head out to where that infectious uh, event is taking place. And this C5A is actually attracting the phagocyte. It's a chemotactic response, meaning you're moving toward a chemical. That's what these cells are doing. They're moving toward this complement, which has associated with this uh, infection zone. And the white blood cells, the neutrophils and macrophages, are going to basically begin to phagocytize the bacteria shown here in green. Now this C3B is basically another type of complement protein that is um, inserting itself on the surface of these bacteria, making it much more palatable to be phagocytized <clears throat> by the white cells. I use the analogy of peanut M&Ms. I like peanut M&Ms. I like peanuts, but I like chocolate around them, all right? So the chocolate coating is this C3B making it much more palatable for these cells to gobble up the peanut M&M. If we didn't have that C3B, we just have a peanut there. With the C3B, we now have a chocolate coat, making it much more desirable to eat. That's a dumb, silly analogy, but that helps you kind of think of it. So an, an opsonin, it's called, the C3B complement protein is acting as an opsonin. It coats the cell making it more likely to be phagocytized. Because we want to get rid of those bacteria. And this last event is involving like one, two, three, four, five different complement proteins, given different names and colors here. And they, they work together in a particular sequence. <clears throat> the first one that comes in is this C5B, and then comes a C6, and then comes a C7, and then a bunch of C, uh, one C8, and then a bunch of C9s and they insert themselves literally in the cell membrane of the pathogen. And when they insert themselves in a certain way, they make a little pore, a little hole, and look what comes out. The cell contents leak out, the cell dies. It's a real effective system at killing the pathogen. That's the complement proteins. And the last thing I'm gonna leave you with where are we here? I'm gonna go right to the last slide. They talk about, um, oh, let's see, natural killer cells, inflammation, phagocytosis, and fever. That's all described there in your book on page 629. So I'd like you to, to just read that over. You can check out the hyperlinks. There's some nice videos there. So we have really only covered today basically 
like three pages of the book. We have spent a lot of time focusing on specific aspects because I think it's really important to do that. Um, on Monday, we're going to get into adaptive or specific defense, which is what you and I think of when we think of the immune response. How when you get sick from a, a particular flu, let's say, virus, you build up protection to that. Yeah, you might get sick, you get better, and if you get subjected to that same virus later in life, you're not going to get sick. You built up some memory. We'll talk about memory T cells and memory B cells. So uh, if you're one that likes to look ahead, that would be really, really good. We're going to get up through about page uh, 638 for, for Monday. So we've got um, quite a few slides to cover next week on Monday. So we're going to we're going to be moving through this, I won't say fast, but we're going to not be dilly-dallying. So if you can look ahead, um, I think that would be to your benefit. It'll make a lot more sense. Now, when you read through this, it's going to be a little confusing perhaps, but at least you'll be familiar with a little bit of what I'm trying to describe if you've had a chance to look ahead. So please, please, please try to do that for Monday. If you can read up through the section that talks about... Um, practical classification of immunity up, up to that, well, actually through that section on page 638, that'd be great. Okay, any questions? This is a harder chapter than some. I guess so, it's an interesting chapter. Oh yeah, it, it is really fascinating. Um, it, it's quite technical in different respects, but it's really fascinating. And given the fact that we're in this pandemic, it's even more interesting because it applies to what we're living through. And yeah. whether we like it or not, you know? Yeah, they talk about herd immunity in here in the book. And we just heard about herd immunity um, on the news the other night. Some countries like Sweden, I think, are taking sort of a hands-off approach to any sort of social distancing. And some people are like, what, you're taking a big risk here. Well, they're hoping that herd immunity protects them. I'm not sure it's going to, but it's, it's just interesting that we're living at a time when, when this is really, you know, something we're talking about. Okay, any other questions otherwise i will see you on monday um, i just have like a last minute question i guess about the um essay at the, the end like credit paper yes okay um at the end of it i was highlighting and putting the pictures down with the sources like the pictures that go with the sources is it okay if i do that or do you want the pictures like in a separate document like I'd put a picture for the source and then I'd put the source below it. Not within the text of the paper, right? Is it at the end of the paper? Yeah, at the end I had like the separate page with the sources cited and then I'd put a picture in and then I'd put the source for that picture, like where I got the picture from, right below the picture itself. Is okay. that okay or do you want like the pictures on different document? Oh, make it easy on yourself. That's fine. Okay. Um, I also have a question real quick about that. Um, my printer and scanner died, so I was going to scan the copies and send them with my essay. Um, can I just add, like, the links to the end of the essay for, like, my articles? So that'll take me to the, to the article, but it won't, it won't let me know that you've used a particular part of that article, right? Yeah. Did you say yes? Yeah, but I can highlight the part of the article that I used within the essay. Oh, okay. That's fine. Why don't you do that? Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> okay. I will see you guys on Monday. The weekend. Okay. Have a great rest of the day. You too. Thanks. Okay.